folks, welcome to the show. This is Trash Movie Bonanza, where Jim and I... Wait, Jim, when did we get merchandise? What are you drinking out of there? What? What the hell is Trash Movie Bonanza? The, the show we do. Who, wait, who are you? Honey, honey, there's a strange man on the, on the screen, on, on, on the, the TV, babe. I, I, I have to alert the authorities. Sure. Uh, classic Jim. Folks, we're going to talk about two monster movies from the 1980s, one much better than the other. Editor Jamie, can you give us that intro? Trash Movie Bonanza with your hosts, Jim and Chris. We're back. Episode two. We haven't actually uploaded the first one yet, folks, but uh, just so that you know, I'm one half of the hosts. Uh, I'm Chris, and with me, as always, is my buddy. My name is... Jimmy James, and I've been known to make a drawing or two out there. One or two. You've been pretty busy lately, actually, (laughs) so I appreciate that you uh, were able to fit this in. I'll I'll be honest, Jim. This has become like the most fun thing to do for me because like everything else is sort of like work and and it can be fun work, but this is just – this is a lot of fun. Uh, We each chose a a schlocky movie to make each other watch that we're going to sort of recap – Mine was Cellar Dweller, and your choice was? Brain Damage. I had not seen either of these before. Yeah. I think one of them was the better overall movie. But they're both entertaining in their own way. Uh, Okay, if I just uh, launch into Cellar Dweller? Let's do it, man. There's a lot to talk about, I think, with both movies. Let me explain why I chose this one real quick. Cellar Dweller is a monster movie that involves comic book illustrators. So I was like, this sounds like it could be up our alley. 1988, there's a lot to recommend on paper, on paper. Um, Like I say, about a comic book artist, technically, uh, director was John Carl Beekler, Mm -hmm. and uh, Beekler had definitely done a lot of cool special effects in movies, uh, both low budget like Ghoulies and bigger stuff like um, Nightmare on Elm Street 4. He directed uh, Friday the 13th Part 7, which I think has some great effects to it. Yes, the new blood. Yeah, but that's a fun one, I think. First Kane Hodder as as Jason. Mm -hmm. Uh, Writer was Don Mancini. The first thing Don Mancini wrote. Now, you won't see his name there because he did decide to ultimately put it under a pen name. He right. wasn't too proud of it. But if you don't know Don Mancini, uh, he's the guy that has written all of the Child's Play and Chucky TV show uh, yes. things. Um, so he, he, I, And I, I kind of like those uh, for the most part. And also Jeffrey Combs was in it. And we've seen Jeffrey Combs in all sorts of cool movies. I love Jeffrey Combs. And man, that was like, the selling point. Cause I hadn't yeah. seen this movie yet. This is on my list. So you recommending it. I was excited to watch it. You get combs. I won't, I'll, I'll let you talk, but I'll just say you get combs in like the first eight minutes. And that's sort of it. Yeah. It, it's <laughs> exactly after right. That, after that, it's like, Oh, okay. well, that's why I say on paper. Cause I'm like, okay, John, John Carl Beekler, but he had 10 days to make this movie <laughs> with a $90,000 budget. Uh, you know, is it about a comic book artist? Sort of not important necessarily, sort of a a plot point, sort of a plot point. The writer decided to use a pen name ultimately not get credited and Jeffrey Combs, it's a glorified cameo, but we get, we'll start with that. Like the movie gives us 30 years ago, which would, since it was in 88, said it in the fifties, you and I know, uh, hopefully the audience does that was the sort of era of EC comics, horror comics, yep. really popular at the time. And that's what Jeffrey Combs is. But you're a professional working artist. Have you ever, Jim, decided to do the work with a tie and a trench coat? It, th- I have so many notes on just the <laughs> intro of him yes. making his comics of between his outfit and the 
scritch scratchy pen nib that has just dried ink on the top. The pages are completely done and finished and he's just miming scratching on on top of it. And it's like, I didn't want to get into the nitpickiness with when we talked about the hand because it looked pretty good when they showed the comic book making. But with this, it's worth mentioning because it, it takes you out of the movie. It takes you out of the illusion of the storytelling of a guy making comics. And it's like, he's, scritching on top of a photocopy of a comic book page like this is, doesn't look right and 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 as an artist of course you notice that but it's so funny like you know these some of it is nitpicking that like we'll notice and the average person won't but the paper is literally like regular paper it 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 flops in a way whereas if you draw on comics you know you've got a harder bristol board yeah. a lot of times something thicker but it's very clear that all he's doing is miming Yes, uh, probably a product of how fast this movie was made. I, I, yeah. I have to imagine there was probably next to no time to get certain props. Right, real quick though, Chris. Though, but don't you think because John Carl Beekler is a smart, creative guy, uh, uh, he would know like, hey, at least take that photocopied big comic book page and like spray mount it to a piece of Bristol board. Like that's a great like, idea. A very, very easy solution. Again, me being very nitpicky, but it it you want to sell the illusion when you're a creator, whether you're making a movie or a comic book or whatever. Like you yeah. want to involve the audience so that their brain isn't distracted by these obvious things that are wrong. It, it, it is funny that they couldn't like even just allow Jeffrey Combs to have a, a, a quill or a brush and, and add some extra marks on top of what was there. Yes. Because uh, c- he clearly isn't. Uh, there might be one or two scenes that where there's drawing, where they're doing a little hatching, but mostly – they're just like drawing lines over big blacked out areas. I will point out though that the initial art that we see by by uh, Jeffrey Combs's character uh, is drawn by Frank Brunner. Yeah, are, are you super familiar with uh, Frank Brunner stuff yes. like Doctor Strange and that? I'm, I'm a fan, and he did uh, some Howard the Duck stuff, mm-hmm. and he did uh, Man Thing covers. Yeah. I, I, I think a, a couple in, in like late seventies. Yeah. Um, but I, I did have to, I knew his name. I looked him up, but I, I'm familiar okay. with his work and, um, um, Tuma Dracula as well covers for that. Mm-hmm. He, he, dude, his yeah. art's awesome. And the it art in this is, is badass. It looks great. Let me, let me, let me clarify that. I will argue half of it is because there's clearly oh, well. <laughs> a second artist later in the movie that we'll get to, but like, yes. Yeah. The Frank yeah. Brunner stuff is, does yeah. look really good and really professional. And I, and I, and, and so like, okay, at the beginning, that's cool. And then we get a total ripoff of a shot from evil dead, like the point of view shot of a, of a evil force rushing at the cabin that Jeffrey Combs character, Colin uh, works at it, it breaks in and, and we um, we'll see that shot repeated quite a bit in this movie to be yeah. fair. This is a very cheap movie in, in certain aspects. Um, Let's see. So he's drawing. He draws a monster that's attacking a woman. And I will say, uh, again, to give the movie some compliments, the monster design is fun. It's cool. Mm-hmm. And and it looks good once we see it. It's got animatronics to move its facial muscles. Um, they, they hide it in shadow well enough. It, it, it doesn't look like a bad monster for sort of a cheap movie. It, it's decent. It works. But that's John Carl Beekler's specialty is like being an effects guy. It's right. like you could tell – he put the most care in supervising the monster. And then some of the rest of the movie, it's like, ah, well, we'll just shoot this quickly and, you know, move on. And Uh, I mean, aside from both of our movies this week, having monsters, both of them are star actors who are primarily known for soap operas. So there's a Mm -hmm. different quality of like the acting compared to last week when we're talking about Michael Caine. Oh, yeah. I mean, dude, Michael Caine wipes the floor with all of these people. But <laughs> when we get to brain damage, though, I do have some complimentary things to say about our main lead actor. Yeah, yeah I do. Yeah. I do, too. Um, so, so OK, so this character, Colin, is is drawing a monster attacking women. He also pulls out like the, the plot device of the movie, which is an ancient tomb. It's got, you know, like the 
Satan star on it and stuff. Uh, I, I don't know what to call it. You know, it's sort of like a cheapy knockoff Necronomicon, essentially. I was just going to say that. He has the Necronomicon. Except it doesn't look that ancient. It looks honestly like pretty nice and new. Like the pages inside <laughs> right. are like really clean and crisp and stuff yeah. like that. Um, and he reads a piece of it. Uh, maybe editor Jamie will be able to include this, but he, he he explains as he's reading it for inspiration for his monster. He says, to contemplate evil is to ask evil home. Woe unto you that gives the beast form. To contemplate evil is to ask evil home. And, and that is the, the, the big idea of this movie is that by basically drawing something evil, you invite that evil into the real world. Right. You, 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 and, and I think that there's something primal about the idea that works. I don't know about you, but some, like as a kid, if I had nightmares, I really felt like if I looked like, you know, any sort of a monster, scary person in the eye, they really took notice of me. And that was the scary part. And, and, and there's a little bit of that there. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the acknowledgement is what manifests it. Yeah. So you much know. more eloquent than me. Uh, well, whatever. I'm having my coffee. So I'm like super alert right now, dude. <laughs> <laughs> and I do not. I learned from coffee. you. I learned from watching pros and cons. I'm like, Mm, a little coffee during the during the stream. During it the does week. make you alert. Yeah, um, I'm, we're spending a lot of time on this, but honestly, it's because this first eight minutes is some of the better paced and looking component of the movie. Yeah. But to 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 sort of recap it by reading this tome, the monster all of a sudden manifests into the real world along with the woman that he was drawing. I guess she just sort of becomes a real person somehow. Uh, and we get boobs within under five minutes. I think that that, if we do this show, we're going to have to come up with some rules of what defines schlock. And I think right. that, you know, nudity in less than five minutes is, is a potential rule that, yeah. that it could be schlock. It's just <laughs> right off the bat. Like we know that teenage boys are watching this. So they know their audience. You it's have monsters, you have special boobs. effect. Right off the bat. Yeah. Uh, what else do you want? Um, <laughs> hilariously, the artist instantly just runs away in fear. He doesn't like try to help the woman at all, which is, you know, just sort of like a component of like, they're not thinking through exactly like people, uh, reacting totally logically. Um, mm -hmm. but he does then decide to grab an ax and run back into his basement, um, uh, art studio, he doesn't really use the axe now that I think of it. The, the woman's dead. Uh, and he just instantly knows that to defeat the monster, if he burns his artwork, that makes it go disappear, which, which I, I was not defined to us as a rule. Yeah. But we go with it. We go with it. He, he, burned, he burns the page to scare the monster off, maybe like a Frankenstein maybe. kind of thing. And then, I didn't think about that, but maybe that's it. And then it just so happens that – Destroying the art will kill the monster, but then a bottle of turpentine also hits the floor. This is this confuses me, Chris. The the studio starts to catch on fire. Right. And Jeffrey Combs just stands there. Right. I have the exact same note right here, yeah. just to be clear, folks. And it's it like almost like going back to our first show with pieces where it's like, you can run, you can, you can get away. You can like the script clearly uh, it, called for him to be trapped by a fire that blazed out of control. But I think that the cheap budget and fast turnaround time meant that they didn't have time to stage it to make sense, which effectively means we, the audience, are just watching as he lights his basement on fire and then just stands there and burns to death with the monster. Yeah. The end. It's, he, does it's he even odd. have a line of dialogue now that I think of it? I don't oh, think he sure. does. I don't. Oh know. no! Wait, excuse me. He reads from the tome. He does oh, read from yes. the tome. Okay, did, yeah. But he doesn't talk to anybody. Yeah, but boy, does he just kind of give up? Yes. He and, just then, and then that's it. That Jeffrey Combs is is out of the movie. L it, let Let me also just sort of point out because other characters will burn later, and uh, this movie is not expensive enough to have a budget for a stuntman to do like, you know, a burning gag. So we're, we're just sort of like, it would be like me. And if there were like digital flames up here and I'd be going, no. 
that's the uh, that's the equivalent of what Jamie, we get. Jamie, can we get some flames on that? Oh my god, yeah, just <laughs> add some add some blue screen <laughs> flames here, and that is that is me being in the exact same scene as Mister Jeffrey. Uh, Combs. We jump forward. Um, oh, we, we don't quite jump forward 30 years because this is a full moon film. Have you watched many full moon movies, Jim, Trancers, Subspecies, any of that? Yeah, it, it the, the Puppet Master Puppet series. Master. It, it's a company owned by Charles Band, correct? Yes, it is. Exactly. And, and man, he he made a killing in the eighties off of VHS, you know, direct to the direct to dump market. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Smart guy. I mean, made cheap schlock and, and made a killing off of it. And a couple of them I do like, I have to admit, like the first few Trancers movies, I have a soft spot for something like Ghoulies is kind of funny. Puppet masters kind of fun here and there. Um, But you can count on these movies being literally just about always 77 minutes. We don't quite get to the hour and a half mark and they pad it with credits. We get like just text credits for literally three full minutes. And when you've got a 77 minute movie and there's end credits of four movies and three minutes here, that means we only have a 70 minute movie. Yeah. That is barely a TV episode. (laughs) Those credits are like, hey folks, this is where you get up and make popcorn and Grab yeah. another beer if you're you hanging out time. with friends or whatever. <laughs> that is a great yeah. observation. You have plenty of time to take a yeah. take a break. Just it, let it play. You don't need to pause it. Go to the bathroom. Make some popcorn. Call your mom. <laughs> you get right. Go you to the local time. store and get a snack or whatever. We jump forward 30 years and we're introduced to six characters. This is a pretty small cast. Uh, effectively, it, it, it does set everything in a in a single location, and that's smart. We're introduced to the main character, Whitney, and she wants to be a comic book artist. She is arriving at a very remote cabin. It, it's it's the artist, Collins' cabin, but now it is, in the modern day, uh, the Throckmorton Institute for the Arts. Didn't 100% understand what it was, but it it's a colony with... Five artists that that get to live there. Yes, five. It's very prestigious. Plus the person that runs it. It's very exclusive. They allow. There's six people in this whole movie. It. it yeah. And without jumping too far ahead, I do want to say, like, to me, I don't know how you feel about it, but like, after Jeffrey Combs leaves the movie, like, none of the other characters are really that appealing to me. No, unfortunately, it, not. It, it. It. Like I say, um, the actress that plays Whitney, um, Deborah. Uh, Farentino, I believe is her name. She was yeah. she she was a soap opera actress, which is fine. I'm just saying that like, and that she's not given a lot to 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 make her extra likable. She's just the main character. Uh, the other characters, I'll just explain. There's there's an older lady, Mrs. Briggs, that sort of runs the house. For some reason, she looks down on Whitney. She doesn't like comic books. Okay. There's Philip, who's a painter, a really terrible one. Uh, oh there's God. Norman. An older guy who's a novelist, like a crime <laughs> novelist. There's Lisa who does performance art. And finally, there's Amanda who does ill-defined videography. Yes. Whitney's arch nemesis. Whitney's arch nemesis. Uh, yes. Uh, there's there's two jerks in the movie, uh, Amanda yeah. and Mrs. Briggs. And they get along and they're, they're, they're sort of they, – they just want to get – Whitney they're, out of the place. They're conspiring against Whitney because, and honestly, this isn't really that fictitious because when I got to art school, there were so many comic book haters in my school mm. that the head dean or whoever she is, Mrs. Briggs of the school, hating comics. It's like, yeah, I, I got that. Especially 88. Like, you know, I think that comics yeah. are probably a lot more respected today than they were in 1988. Yeah. It's, um, it's funny to see. And dude, by the way, I, I we're pr- close to the same age in the eighties, the kid who plays Philip. I remember seeing him in every sitcom from like facts of life to yeah. family ties or like whatever, all those shows. Of the are class, I believe he was yeah. like a cast member on. They're uh, all sort of the same show, but and he uh, plays it like that. Yes. He's in a different movie than the rest of them. Yes. yes. But there's That's always right. a comic relief, I think, in, in in these sort of horror movies. So it sort of works. It's just that they don't really give him any great jokes. He's just a jokester. Yeah. Um, that's his personality. Do you know what he does now, the actor? No. 
He's been the president of Nickelodeon and Paramount since something like 2019 or something. Oh, isn't that shit. bizarre? That's hilarious. Like That's what crazy. a what a career path like from like this cheapy uh horror movie to being the president of like, you know, a Viacom company. Just yeah. That's amazing. Wow, okay. <laughs> no. But good, yeah. Good for him. Um, no, he's he's playing 80s sitcom idiot guy in this where it's kind of like a grown worthy performance whenever he's on camera like oh philip you have such a punchable face like could you just <laughs> could you just die already i mean <laughs> yeah know? they're trying to make him like you know like lightly tease whitney because by default he's the sort of love interest there's no other young guy that could be so he just sort of is um yep. but he like specifically goes like you know like one of his first lines to whitney is like aren't you a little old for comic books and i was right. like f you you don't yeah. talk like that about comics What do you think? It's it's very nice. That's but that's a cow in there, huh? It's, it's very nice. It's angst. Sorry. Philip Lemley. Whitney Taylor. Enchanted. Likewise. Aren't you a little old for comics, Whitney? Aren't you a little young to be a critic, Philip? Yeah, it, it's a lot, a lot of hate toward that. Um, when Whitney checks into her room, though, I, this is a deep cut. There's a reanimator poster on the wall. Which, which breaks the fourth wall slightly. Yeah, because Jeffrey Combs is on the poster. Um, yeah, it's so, kind of weird. But, but it's not just reanimator, to be fair. <laughs> it's covered in full moon posters. Uh, yeah, stuff like yeah. dolls and stuff like that. I don't know. There was probably like a robot jocks poster back there if I looked close enough. I don't know. Yeah, um, well, robot jocks. That's a <laughs> whole other thing Whit going on. Whitney has like a brief it, it sort of meeting with Mrs. Briggs, this sort of harsh house mistress of the place. And, and she did mention that um, she went to the Rhode Island School of Design. I thought that that was interesting to like mm -hmm. list an actual place where people could learn cartooning. I was like, okay, there's like, you know, <laughs> a token effort towards uh, a reality there. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of the only thing grounded in reality here. And that's fair. so just to be clear, Chris, like, so the main plot thrust of the movie is Whitney shows up at this art school to mm -hmm. follow in the footsteps of the Jeffrey Colin Combs Childress. character. Col Colin Chil Childress. Is that how you say it? Yeah, Children? Colin Childress was Jeffrey Combs' character. And to continue on the legacy of his EC comics inspired, his EC inspired type horror comic that he's doing. She grew up loving that. that that's what she yeah. wants to do is follow in his footsteps. As a child, I collected every issue of Cellar Dweller, no matter how hard they were to track down. <sighs> I'm not surprised. And it's a total coincidence that the place she gets to sort of work in her art is also the place where he died, but whatever. Yeah, it's a it's a happy accident. That's yes, a, that's the gist <laughs> of of of, the, of like what brings her there. L let me um sidetrack us briefly. Uh, the people that were studying there, I thought were sort of being portrayed as like maybe like fresh college graduates slash maybe still supposedly in college. Did you get any of that, or or am I making that up? Yes, I got that. But I also got that uh, Beekler probably went to art school and each character is a different art school stereotype that he's making fun of. Because there's That's even fair. like there's That's even fair. like the old um, writer guy, the performance yeah. artist guy in art school, man. And even Dan Klaus shouts this out in an art school confidential. There's always like the one old person that's like, yeah. what's this person doing here? And, you know, there's the um, eccentric, weird performance artist girl who I thought he would, that, that girl's like making fun of basically every girl in LA in a way. Like, totally. I'm an actress. Totally. I'm, gonna, I'm a performance artist. It's like, what do you really I'm doing do something though? deep here. This is all bullshit. It's not real. Well, and, even and, like Philip, like his art is like legit terrible it's looking. terrible and i don't know if it's supposed to be terrible or if they didn't have enough time and, and i don't know because the no, art that's is a good that's a good point yeah but to me he represents like the the fine art painter guy or whatever that's like also kind of kind of full of shit in a way that yeah. 
is basically making like finger paint pieces and he and he's they saying totally are. these are deep this is meaningful this one's about despair or whatever he tells angst. whitney and angst and whitney's kind of like oh okay i she's I like that's know. a cow i was like that's <laughs> yes yeah. there are little bits of this yeah. that are totally entertaining yeah. i will admit yeah one thing that's inadvertently entertaining is how old all these people are, even though they seem to be playing young people. Because the actress playing Whitney was like 29. Lisa, the performance artist, is 28. The 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 videographer girl who supposedly went to school at the same time as Whitney, uh, she's like at least 42. Wow. They're older. Okay. They don't to me yeah. look like they're 20, like yeah. 19, 20, yeah. 21. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, art school is the last uh, refuge for some of society's just uh, lost people that are like, what am I going to do at regular college? I'll just go to art school and fuck around for four years. We had that at my school, man. We had kids that were just like, you'd see their work and it's like, oh, mom and dad had a trust fund and these kids are just hanging out here for four years. Interesting. Interesting. So I, I, they could have included I'm not one trying like to that. read in. I'm not trying to read into cellar dweller <laughs> that much, but at the same time, I feel like I think Beekler just knew these people. Like I bet he, you're right. I, th- there's an element of authenticity to each each type. They're they're sort of archetypes, but that's okay it, for yeah. a horror movie. It works. It's just that there's also not too many, you know, like in a Friday, the 13th movie, you might go through like 20 kills. And in this, you're like, okay, there's like six characters. We're not going to get too many kills. And you can probably even guess where this is going because that intro eight minutes sets up exactly what's going to happen again. Just stretched out. Whitney mm-hmm. wants to go into the basement. It's off limits. She eventually, eventually that first night, she like goes down there. Yeah. She, she imagines going down there first. And at first we're like, whoa, she just like went straight there. But then like it, it turns out it was she she had a quick uh, daydream about going down there and seeing a zombie version of Colin Childress. Yeah. She has like a kind of a trippy nightmare vision of. But while going wide down away, there, it's just sort uh, of a time killer. And and then I don't know what the point of that was, but it, it, was, to, it was to eat up 77 minutes well, of time. That's Jim. true. But also to warn her of the danger that lurks down there. But she doesn't care because she winds up going down there for real anyway. She does. And discovering the studio and, and um, you know. Uh, and it's just so weird because like, you know, like Mrs. Briggs is like, that's off limits. And it feels like something bad would like instantly happen if she went down there, like get kicked out of school or encounter like something really scary or something like right away. But instead she basically just like asks if she can have permission to live there. And Mrs. Briggs is against it because she doesn't like Whitney. And Whitney's like, it would free up another room for like a real artist to be in. And she's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. It's very easy. It's not an obstacle. Let's move it along. Let's move this uh, scene along. Let's people make weird decisions in this movie. That's the thing. Like because remember, um, Whitney's new, and they're like, sometimes we show each other our art to give each other critiques. Fair enough. They're looking at Philip's art, and th- we're first introduced to Norman because he grabs Lisa, the performance artist, with a gun to her head. He shoots it at a sculpture there, which explodes. So he's got. <laughs> Live ammo. And Whitney's like, I can see the rest of the, the barrel is empty. This is this is, you, you guys are acting, and they're like, You got us. You yeah. got us. I'm like, oh my God, you just put a gun to this girl's head. Even this one a, bullet. This is a lawless art school. What the hell's going on here? And Whitney is, you know, I guess a part it's like she has the skills of a detective to know to like look at the gun barrel and be like, that's sad, uh, chamber's empty. And that is not foreshadowing. She does not need those skills later or anything. That is just meant to be, I guess, an interesting introduction to to Norman, who is honestly like got the character with the least amount of screen time. He just put a bullet in the wall. Yeah. Yeah. Not Phil- kicked out of school for doing that, Chris. He's he's still This is the Throckmorton Institute. <laughs> they're, they're they're a lawless land. They're a lawless <laughs> land. Um so Whitney, with the help of Philip, clean up the downstairs basement. We get like a quick montage. It's clean. By the way, remember, 
This supposedly caught on fire so bad that it killed Colin Childress. I guess the fire just went out on its own because like the, the, the cabin is still there. And honestly, the downstairs doesn't look that bad. No, none of it's burnt up. Like none of Jeffrey Combs' possessions are burnt up. Like the tables there, the drawing table, the the chest where she discovers the, the Necronomicon. Club. And st- that's just, that's all there. I think what would have been more effective, and, and, and I hate to like sort of go like, I can improve something, but if everything had been really burnt up, but for some reason that book was untouched, I'd go, oh, you know, there's something sinister there. Yep. They don't yeah. go that far. Um, at this point, Whitney's drawing a lot of the time. And and when she draws the monster, it's going to manifest in the real world. But I will say, they definitely use a different artist. I can't, I couldn't figure out who they use for it. I don't like the art by by the person that like is doing yeah. Whitney's art. I don't like it at all. It's, it's definitely more of the only positive thing I will say about it is it's definitely more of like an underground zine kind of style That's of drawing. Fair. But it's it's crude and it's pretty crappy. Um, and, and the artist like really emphasizes the nipples on every character. They're always like outlined. And yeah. I'm like, would Whitney be doing that? I don't know. Whitney is a pervert of some sort, but not to jump ahead, but dude, when she's drawing the full-blown comic book page yeah. and things start to manifest, she's going straight to ink. She's on some like Bill yeah. Sinkavich, no pencil. Kim Jung G type shit, which I, I respected that, Chris. I'm like, <laughs> hey, I get straight to pen a lot of times, but she's just fu- she's fully drawing and rendering panels in real time, straight to ink. And when the camera goes back to that panel, there's also zip tone in. I saw that. It's like, where I was is like, that is a very going? time consuming process. Where? And what's funny about this, folks, we, we are getting technical. We're getting into, into the weeds here. But Amanda starts spying on Whitney while she's drawing her first page with a video camera. Uh, it's to she, she's she's we see in like within this whole scene, she's editing together a piece to accuse Whitney of plagiarism which I thought was a little interesting. But what's funny is as she like, and by the way, she's recording that from a window that's like 10 feet tops from Whitney, but somehow Whitney doesn't see this humongous 1980s camcorder aimed at her. Yeah, just not aware of it. Uh, Whitney's drawing a page and she's she's mad at at, um, Amanda, so she's drawing her into the page, like getting attacked by the monster. And upstairs, while Amanda, I guess, edits or something, the monster comes into being. It is with true. But, but here's what I'm talking about. You're, you're mentioning like Zipatone and stuff. This is just, this would take quite a while. Yes. Not just like it happens within this day, you know, like she's got a full page inks, zip tone that would, I feel like give a lot of time for this monster to come into existence and, and somebody to yeah. notice and run. She goes straight to ink on and finishes a full page in like five minutes. It's incredible. It's, it's impressive. It's like, can I hire Whitney as my studio assistant? Like can, can uh, I need someone that quick that can just help, with the production of comics, man. You Absolutely. Could, it's like, it's like, wow, this is uh suddenly Jack Kirby's studio or something. I, I, I don't Amanda may not be the best artist, but at least she's fast. She's going to get the job because she can get it done by the deadline. Yeah. Whitney, you mean? What did I say, Amanda? Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's they, all, they all blend together. I, Such I know, generic yeah. names. Um, they're all white. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yes. I'm like looking at my notes. Oh, that said, so the monster comes into existence and attacks Amanda. I I was amused at one thing and annoyed at another. Whitney draws a banana peel into a panel and, and that comes into existence, which causes Amanda to slip and not escape the monster. I was like, all right, that's honestly a little bit funny. That's a yeah. little funny. There's like, it's th- like a straight up Looney Tunes gag. It- well, it... And that was what I was going to say next, though, is that then she draws that 
there's no doorknob on the no, on the door. So so Amanda can't open the door. And they add this cartoonish boing sound effect, which to me killed the tension of the monster. Yep. I was like, oh, what are you doing? What are you doing? Like slipping, it's a little funny, but like it puts her in danger. But like adding that boing. boing yeah. Oh, I hated it. I hated it. Very no, silly. Um yeah. It's just it, yeah, man, there's a lot of um I don't I don't know if I would call it like would you call it laziness when it comes they were rushed. They had to make this movie in 10 days like you said. So there are moments where it just seems like it is whose decision making is 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 making this stuff happen? Like what's going on? I, I feel like maybe they're just they just made up a lot of shit while they were on set. I think so too. I think so too. Because um and and they're patting it like we 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 get like after that, I say kill. We don't actually get to see the kill. We only see the monster eating Amanda's body, and that was a little disappointing. But then we get a third shot of that monster going for the door, like the third time in this movie. And then we have to sit through some of um, Lisa's performance art piece, and oh, that. God felt like what you're yeah. just saying, like where it felt like she was just making it up that day. And they were like, yeah, yeah. That, that'll work. Record that. Yeah. It, it doesn't make much sense. There's not a lot to it. She's dancing on a stage and popping balloons and, you know, like, I don't yeah, know. I, it's, it's nonsense. It's no, nonsense. I, I don't know. <laughs> What's funny is for a minute, they seem to be building tension because everybody's watching Lisa's performance. They... Uh, Mrs. Briggs has gone into Amanda's room to look for her, but for some reason, all the blood is gone and yet the doorknob is still missing. So it's inconsistent. But, but while everybody then gathers together to watch Lisa, Norman all of a sudden puts on his detective cap and sneaks outside. He sneaks downstairs. He takes some of Whitney's art. He goes into mm -hmm. Amanda's room and watches her edited plagiarism video. And he's like, I've got you, Whitney. I was like, I had no idea this guy cared. Yeah. And and what's he talking about? Like, I got you. I, anyway, um, the monster does reappear. The only good kill in this movie knocks knocks Norman's head right off. Yeah, yeah, that is a cool kill. That would that look pretty good for the, for a movie like this, right? It's. I feel like is that the only sort of on camera kill? Only bloody kill that we see. Other than that, it's just the monster eating. Like bloody the body parts. Of food. Yeah. Yeah. The only kill we really get, to be honest. You, the, you could tell, man, Beekler like really was happy with the finished monster because it's like, oh, yeah. let's just get that close up of the monster's face chewing on bones. There's a little meat and blood coming out. Like we're confident with that part of it. Yeah. But we don't really have the time or the money to actually have the monster on camera <laughs> murdering people. Like that's the too stuff that much. people would want. Yeah. No, instead, they basically, the next special effect you get to see is more nudity because Lisa takes a shower. <laughs> right. The big Lisa takes a shower scene. I feel like the budget all went to the monster and then Beekler asking all the girls like, okay, who, for, for some extra bucks, like who's willing to show their boobs and home more girl who one <laughs> home girl was like, I'll do the shower. Do it, scene. It's fine. Yeah. It, it. Um, <laughs> it, it does slow down between like, the kill where Norman gets his head knocked off. And then like when the monster appears from Lisa taking the shower and it, and it kills her. Um, and at this point we're down to like not many characters left. Uh, you know, the monster kills Lisa chases Whitney and Philip a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to think of what happened to Philip. Does Philip get killed? No, no, no. What? It pulls him into the drawing. Like uh, that, that aha music video, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. And Whitney freaks out and then has, and then reveals everything that's going on to Mrs. Briggs. Who's the, then, the only two characters left now. And then this confused me, man. So the monster is now able to manifest through one of the characters because Mrs. Yeah. Briggs now transforms into the beast, into the creature. Going through a lot of changes lately, which has a few good little effects. Um, yeah, you know, it's what Beekler can do. You're right. If 
if that's all that happened at this point, the monster manifested out of Mrs. Briggs, I go, okay, maybe Mrs. Briggs was somehow, you know, like this dark spirit the whole time. But she does reappear later in the movie. I'll explain. So like Mrs. Briggs turns into the monster. Whitney runs from it, ends up back in the basement, accidentally spills some whiteout on the art, which makes the monster disappear. Incredible. By the way, it, it's a, also a little funny. She's got this tiny little bottle that she's like throwing like, you know, like, a, yes. you know, and I'm sure it's intentional, like, you know, like a priest throwing holy water or something like that. But when we cut to the art page, it is like been doused in a bucket yes. of paint. It's yes. kind of funny. Yeah. Um, I have a note that just says whiteout defeats the beast. Whiteout like is was, what defeats the beast. That was the magic uh, solution. And, and here's when things, honestly, for me, get the dumbest. Whitney has defeated the monster, but she really misses Philip. So she sits down <laughs> and draws Philip chaining up the monster, which causes Philip to come back to life. Yeah. But she also just brought back the monster. I don't understand. It's so dumb. And then Philip's like, draw everybody else. She draws everybody's portraits. We get back to Frank Brunner art, by the way. Yep. Frank yep. Brunner was supposedly the, the just drawing for Colin, but now Whitney got like, she leveled up her art skills. Yes. <laughs> the fear, that whiteout incident really helped her drawing skills. She's or, like, you know what? Let's start I, from a clean slate. Forget that <laughs> earlier art. I've got a new style in mind. Um, but yeah, she draws portraits of everybody. They're all back. And they decide to burn the picture of the beast. Smart. Until, I guess, accidentally, all those portraits fall into the into the burning trash pile. Yeah, I mean, that was the what the f moment at, at the end. It really of, was of the movie of like, oh wait, okay, so it's <laughs> it's not going to work out. It it. Uh, you, it it plays with you because like she literally just brought everybody yeah. back, including Mrs. Briggs, which implies that she is separate from the beast because the beast yeah. is now chained up in the basement. He's the cellar dweller. Um, yes. Or maybe Whitney's the cellar dweller. I don't know. They're both cellar dwellers. Yeah, because the beast was able to get out of the cellar when he took over Mrs. Briggs' body. Well, he wasn't chained up yet then. He got chained that's up right true. after that. But I guess I meant he's just not restricted to the cellar. He this we're basically done here because yes, like all, <laughs> yeah, all of this conversation. No, it's not that. It's just that like <laughs> it's it's that like we're almost done and the rules haven't been established for exactly how this creature works. We understand that, like, you know, reading from like this satanic tome and deciding to take those ideas and draw them manifests it into reality. Fair enough. But the rules of, of how and when he can appear, because we're skipping over it, but basically extra comic book pages just appear on the desk. And Whitney's like, I didn't draw these. And yeah. That's how the beast is able to kill like Lisa and stuff like that. Cause uh, Whitney wouldn't have drawn the monster killing Lisa, for instance. Right. She wouldn't have right. drawn it pulling Philip into the, the 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 art, so it sort of gets extra power, um, and 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 it ends with like the monster all of a sudden re you know just being free and just yelling at Whitney like he's going to eat her. Yes, and then nothing was accomplished. I mean, dude, Philip like burns at the end. Philip is like, but again, he he he. The acting is decent for that, but the effect is still like you know the flames on the four screen. Yeah, not. It would have been so much more impactful if they just had a little bit of time to to set a stunt man on fire. That would have yeah. been amazing. Yeah. That would have been so cool. Unfortunately, none of that. It's just the characters screaming while in the foreground there's some flames. So at the very end, when the last shot we see Whitney and when she's screaming, cut to black, there's monster chewing sounds. We're meant to believe that Whitney, everyone dies. I think so. I think so. Yeah. That's my impression.
is it's, that it's a little nihilistic. I don't care that much though. I don't, well, I don't either. I don't either. But it's like, oh shit. Okay, so the, so this movie, in a nutshell, this girl shows up at art school and then everyone dies. I think we probably meant to uh, to believe that this is just something that that keeps happening. Maybe like once a generation or something that like somebody comes across this book, gets inspired by it. But you should. I don't know what the warning here is. Is like the warning to like be careful what you're inspired by. Is it like you know that you create evil by being creative i i don't understand what the what the message is yeah it's like be careful what you are desire what you want because it's like, not like what you're, somebody's you're, wishing for they, they, they're, they're drawing and that and that like creates something evil but i feel like that's not an evil pursuit yeah yeah again man i can't tell the difference between like the budget constraints and and laziness and the deadline of 10 days. I don't know how you shoot in a movie in 10 days. I mean, it, so, I mean, yeah, it, that, that, that's fast. That, that was really fast for especially something that does have to have like those, those creature effects had to take a little while, no matter what they just had to take yeah. a little while. Uh, even though there's not a lot to them. I don't know. Uh, I think that probably there were, there were plans to do something more ambitious with more interesting kills, maybe even more characters at the place, but it just probably kept getting like shrunk. That's yeah. just my best guess. Yeah. It's interesting. Let me ask you, do you feel like it was somewhat accurate as far as like how a comic book artist might operate? Or do you feel like it's just sort of just a sheen that's like painted over the top of, of something? I don't know. That's a good question. I feel like they fudged a lot and... I don't know. I mean, Beekler passed away, but I don't know. I, I associate him as this creative guy. Yeah. And I just would assume that he knew comic artists and could have, could have put in a little bit more detail or attention. Well, here's an example, man. In, in, in chasing Amy, like Kevin yeah. Smith and, 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 and his producer, Scott Mosier were smart enough to have a shot of, Affleck and Jason Lee at their tables in their studio. And then it cuts to a close up of the comic page. And we have Mike Allred's hand actually inking the art because yeah. Mike did the art. So yeah. it's like, get the actors, then get the shot of the actual guy who did the art. It adds to the believability. It adds to the world building. It's a small detail, but to me, it's an important thing to sell what the illusion. Well, the and, last and, episode, we had something a little similar where Michael Caine was the car comic book artist. They've got the Barry Windsor Smith pages, but th at least they allowed him to sort of add cross hatching lines on top of, you know, what was there. So yeah. it looked a little more convincing. Yeah. It's just, I don't know the minor details, but, but it, it all the comic making stuff seemed like, um, just sort of tacked on. Like it was just, I would have loved a little bit more because You've got like the bones of an interesting idea there with EC Comics, basically. Like yep. Cellar Dweller is definitely meant to evoke an EC Comics thing, but they don't really dig into it. That would have right. interested me. Maybe I'm biased. I think that still would have given a little bit more authenticity to the characters in the world. I agree. I'm, I'm glad we watched it, though, because I... It's been on my list. Like I said, I was curious about it. Jeffrey Combs and the and and I'm a fan of Charles Band and and, yeah. and the stuff he produces. It's just his line of movies, man. I feel like are really hit or miss. Yeah, like you're either gonna get a winner, like the, um, the, the uh, Puppet Master movies um, or, or Ghoulies. The first one's fun. I haven't seen it in a while, but some of them are just like such stinkers that it's it's kind of you, you don't know it's what hit and miss there's no question it. it's hit and miss and this one's sort of in the middle for for what full moon makes if you go in with expectations for you've seen full moon movies you might not be disappointed if you yeah. go in like just expecting a decent horror movie you might be a little disappointed because there's not a lot of blood and guts or anything like that and and there's not a lot of tension if you do want to see something good by Car john carl beekler i sincerely would say Friday the 13th 7 is, is, is a lot better. It's 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 a decent enough movie. Yeah. And and what was it Nightmare on Elm Street 4? He did the effects on on Nightmare on Elm Street okay. 4. He did which had good effects. That was I think the one by Rennie Harlan if I'm remembering right, which was kind of oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Shit. Okay. 
let's talk about one, in my opinion, your choice for what to make me watch, I think was a better movie. By the way, both came out in 88. Yes. Um, Very different look. Where do I begin? Uh, Brain damage. I'm glad that you brought up rules because rules are so important to horror movies, man. And one thing about brain damage is it so clearly establishes the rules of what's happening and what this creature does and what his relationship is to the host that he infects that it's not revealed right away in the movie. Thank God. But when it is established, you know exactly what the stakes are. And there's an internal logic to everything. Yeah. So with brain damage, I definitely have to start off by saying uh, on the Mount Everest of schlock auteur brilliant directors is Frank Henlotter, who, you know, in the 80s produced this glorious cult trilogy of Basket Case, Brain Damage, and Frankenhooker. These are all awesome, hilarious, over-the-top, ridiculous movies. Frank is a New York native, and according to legend, he is a Greenwich Village staple. He's a legend. Everyone knows him. And there's a huge scene in there that I will talk about later in this episode yes. like that I loved. Because yeah. you know what I liked about it? it? It's gritty and grimy and totally portrays a New York that doesn't really exist anymore. But it, yes. there's, there's some something very cool about 1980s New York. Oh, man. And like speaking of grimy, so in the 60s and 70s, Frank was a regular on 42nd Street, uh, that street of all the old grindhouse theaters. Yeah. And, you know, I read an interview with him where he claims that some days he would go and see up to six different movies. Holy like he shit. was that big of a fanatic. And he's known as like an archivist and a historian for these schlock movies. Okay. So anyway, Basket Case is... Um, Not Basket Case. We're doing brain damage. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. God damn it. Yeah. My mind is on basket, basket case. case is the one everybody sort of, if they know him, they, they, they know that one, but brain yes. damage, brain damage. I don't think got as much sort of credit in its day, but I do think yeah. it holds up pretty darn, darn well for what it is. Definitely. And there's all these different, you know, uh, analysis of brain damage, which is like, it's a metaphor for drug addiction. It's a metaphor for this. It's like, well, sure. Yeah. But also At the core of it, it's a monster movie about a dildo-shaped slug that attaches itself to a host, a human, shoots its blue magic juice into their brain to give them a psychedelic, incredible, euphoric experience. Yeah. And in trade, the trade-off is the human gets to feel great and like they're on drugs and ecstasy at all times, but then the slug rides around on you and you deliver it to different humans so it can jump off you for a brief moment and attack them and suck their brains out. Yeah. Yeah. Is that the basic gist, the gist That's of the, gist the of movie? Uh, um, but, but, but one thing worth noting is the monster isn't, it isn't just say a mindless beast like the one we were just in. It has a big personality. It talks, yeah. it's got a face. It's, it's a character in and of itself. And um, dude, I didn't know, I don't know if you know this, but well, his name is Elmer in the movie or Aylmer is the proper- I looked up a lot of this. Pronunciation going back to ancient times, but anyway- Uh, Middle ages, middle ages. It meant something like awe-inspiring one, Aylmer, which they literally have a scene where they spell it. Yes. A-Y-L-M-E-R. Chris, are you you referring to the- um, Le- the classic, uh, infamous old man exposition in the alley scene where he yeah. reveals the entire origin of Elmer, which it's an awesome scene, yeah. but it's also like, oh, this old man is just explaining the entire history. Of- oh, that's great. Cool. I didn't expect to get all that, to be honest, but yeah. it's fine. It, it, it works. Elmer belongs to me. Elmer? You fucking named him Elmer? Not Elmer. Aylmer, A-Y-L-M-E-R, an old English word meaning the all-inspiring famous one, and that he is indeed, for the Aylmer is a creature of endless histories, a living relic of civilizations long since forgotten. 
You're crazy. Am I? The Elmer's origins can be traced back to the Fourth Crusade. Also, um, worth noting, uh, according to Joe Bob Briggs, Elmer, voiced by John Zacherly, the John very Zachary. first horror TV host. Yep. Uh, historic, legendary character. But, dude, his personality, Elmer, is such a fun, over-the-top, like, almost charming. He's very charming. Character. No, let me say that. Like he he's doing evil things. He's eating brains and stuff and 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 addicting people to his juice. Yeah. Uh but he's very charming. But I guess we can get into it if we break it down. I mean, yeah. Where, it, where should we start with this one? I, well, I, I mean, I can set up just real quick like there's an old apartment building in New York. There there's an old couple that's freaking out because they've lost something. And boy, is the old lady really freaking out. She She's, goes up to 11, like right off the bat. We've just started the movie and she isn't just like freaking out. She's she's in hysteria. Elmer Dandin. What? What? He's gone. Oh my God! He's gone! He's gone! It's something miracle. Uh, but then you realize later, it's like, oh well, she's a junkie, mm -hmm. and she, she's going through a withdrawal. Yeah, she's freaked out because she doesn't know where the next fix is coming from. Uh, turns out Elmer has been theirs for quite a while. He escapes, and then we cut to a different apartment with this young dude, Brian who's about to go on a date with his girlfriend, but he's sick. And it's revealed later that Elmer has wormed his way into his bed as attached himself to Brian. Right. So Brian and Elmer are now in the symbiotic relationship. That's a great way to say it. Cause I mean, Elmer is a parasite, but, but maybe it makes more sense to call him like a, a symbiote because they get something from each other in a way. Yeah. Ideally, I guess. And as we go along, Chris, there's a lot, there's so many deep cuts in this one that I have to point out because I am a music fanatic and I know you are too. In Brian's apartment, um, there's some very deep cuts of, I'm going to say the name of this band. Um, I don't think Jamie's I picked up on Jamie's, this. Jamie's going to have to censor it out because you can't say this name on in YouTube, but there's a poster for on Brian's bedroom wall and this is a deep cut of being this proto-punk late 70s cbgb electronic band that did the song ghost rider ghost oh, rider motorcycle no hero and rollins band covered this song years later and they also did uh, this song sheree sheree my comic book fantasy so all There's these a little comic book stuff there and then there's also posters for Bauhaus Slayer and Susie and the Banshees so cool I so, love that like new new wave stuff the, yeah. the early new wave stuff by so 1988 it would have been a little more established but that was really cool stuff I, I love all that stuff and I don't know if that's Head and Lauder being a New York native and knowing these bands and, and or if someone, the set decorator was like, let's, it's a young kid. Let's put these like gothy emo, darker bands on his wall. I, I'm not I sure, but either way, Brian and his brother, Mike is his roommate. They have incredible taste in music is my whole point. <laughs> yes, they do. Um, so we also established that Brian and his girlfriend, her name is Barbara, uh, th things are, aren't working out with them. And now we introduce no. this element of Elmer and, uh, and he has his it, first, uh, trip. He has his first euphoric psychedelic. That experience. was an interesting one, by the way, there's a lot of like, uh, the color blue in this. Yeah. Like, Elmer's a dark blue. We get close up shots of like, you know, his, his needle, like dripping blue juice onto the brain, which causes little electric, shocks yeah and, and and the first trip he just imagines like this super blue water starting to just pour into his floor and it yeah. and i was like oh it's like ruining everything but but it's all in his head yeah really creative it was effective and, imagery i mean these movies are also i mean all the head and ladder stuff is made on a budget as well but there's a creativity involved yeah. that i think 
not that we have to compare, but I think it definitely surpasses like seller dweller on the creativity and just ingenuity of like, how do we convey this trip? How do we convey the feeling? How do we establish what this character is? And then we literally get a scene where Elmer is explaining to Brian what this is, what is happening, what the relationship is going to be. Hi. This is the start of your new life, Brian. A life without worry or pain or loneliness. A life filled instead with colors and music and euphoria. A life of light and pleasure. But who are you? What are you? I am you, Brian. I'm all you'll ever need. I don't understand. You will, Brian. From now on, your life will take on a whole new light. And all you have to do is look into the light and listen. And then... Brian puts him on his neck, gets another trip, and they go out and they get their first kill in a junkyard where a- Oh yeah, that was they, weird actually though, I will say. The hardest working, most yes. overly concerned security guard sees Brian out in the junkyard screaming and having a good time yeah. and like cocks a gun and is right. like, not you on just, my like, watch. just like escalated things like really high. I'm like, these are just like, it's a junkyard- specifically of crushed cars that are stacked yeah. up. It's like, does this guy think that Brian's going to take one of these crushed cars? <laughs> like the, the gun definitely escalated things in a way. I was like, Whoa, what are you doing? Like this yeah. guy is no threat. Yeah. It's, um, that was a little funny to me. And Brian doesn't know what's happening. He's tripping out and the guy gets close enough that to Brian, that Elmer jumps off attaches himself to his, to the security guard's head. And I guess he can just, then, like, he's got lots of little teeth. I guess they yeah. can eat through, through bone. And, and carnage and insanity ensue. Freeze, asshole! All these colors. Shut the fuck up, asshole. Honey, on your bullies, don't make a fucking sound. Oh. What the fuck is that? Roll over! What's going on? What are you what are you doing? Is he okay? Not bad. A bit underdone. Let's go. We better get out of here. It's fantastic. Um, dude, your first time watching this movie, like what were your what was your initial reaction of just seeing the actual like crazy effects and the the puppet from the I feel like the the Elmer puppet from the side view opening his mouth. Yeah. With the close up of the neck. Like the first time I saw that, I was like what is happening now? What is this movie? Like what? It's like you look at the puppet uh, and you sort of know that it's a puppet, but then again, these days you sort of know when something's digital and there's still like, you know, just a tactile uh, quality to it. There, you, you know that it's physically there. And I don't know, I found it very easy to buy into Aylmer as a character I'll give a lot of the, the credit to that, um, to the voice actor. Like he, yeah. he, he really imbues it with a personality you wouldn't guess. He, he doesn't talk like sinisterly. He, right. He's very polite. He's very <laughs> eloquent. Yeah. yeah. And he just knows what he is and yeah. he's totally okay with it. Um, and he's been, he's been doing this for a long time. So he knows how, he knows to, how manipulate to manipulate human beings. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, he's a manipulator. He's a manipulator. So he's not a good person, but it, it it's also almost easy to be like, he would be a fun little uh, being to have a conversation with. <laughs> yes, completely. Um, so, he's, he, so he's both like, he's, he's a unique mix of like horrific and kind of goofy. Because yeah. he's got like almost like cartoony little eyes. And when he opens his mouth, you know, he's got like teeth and like little tendrils that are moving around. Um, it's done on a budget. So, so you know, like, I don't know. It, it, there's a creepy uh, idea in there. 
sometimes it's a little funny with his charming little eyes that are yeah. almost crossed. Y- yes. The crazy shit, man. And so Brian, after this first kill, Brian basically becomes addicted. His girlfriend reminds him that they have a date. Uh, he gets out of the tub. They go to this restaurant and he's basically explaining to her how his life has changed. He's having these visions. He can see clearly. He can see colors. She immediately thinks he's on drugs. And as he, he tries, and he is, but he says, oh, it's so much more than that. It's not that simple, he tells her. And then as he's about to just tell her what's going on, Elmer is attached to him and is like giving him jolts to the point where- Little ones, yeah. He, he can't explain to her what's going on. Sometimes, sometimes I can see completely. I can hear voices and music and the flicker of a match. I can look into a mirror and see a thousand different faces staring back at me. I can turn night into day or, or, or watch the darkness shine and I don't even have to open my eyes. You're on drugs, right? <laughs> <laughs> Nothing that simple. Then what? I'm trying to understand you, Brian, but I feel like I'm talking to a stranger. Okay, okay, I'll try to explain it, but I doubt you're gonna believe me. Remember that night you and Mike went to the concert? Well, when I woke up, I... I loved the scene um, where it's it's kind of quick and subtle, but like he... Brian, is it? Is it? It's Brian? Yep. Yeah. He looks at his girlfriend's dinner, which is like crab, and it starts to like move. Yeah. It like comes back to life in his mind. And I was like, oh, that, 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 that's very disturbing for some reason. Yeah. I like that. And then he starts to hallucinate in the restaurant and his spaghetti with meatballs, the meatballs start oh, yeah. turning into vibrating, pulsating little brains. Oh, so yeah. It's crazy shit. It's awesome. And then he basically flips out and runs out of the restaurant. Yes. And then we have the St. Mark's scene, which I want Love. you to- My favorite thing. My favorite about. thing, just in visually, there is a really long tracking shot. It was like, obviously like filmed across the street, St. Mark's, like, you know, the, the East Village, uh, 1980s, a little grimy, but there was still like a lot of businesses, you know, from like restaurants to boutique stores and everything. And I've been there many times throughout the years. I grew up on the East Coast and I was like, oh, this is so cool to be able to not just see it, but see it as as sort of I remember it when I was really young. Mm-hmm. I, I recognized it so well, Jim. I, rec- I, I identified where the old store St. Mark's Comics would have been. Yep. Uh, because there's a there was a really old store, sort of like almost in a, the basement level on 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 this street, uh, St. Mark's. They still exist, but I think over in like Brooklyn or something like that. You know, like rent definitely got too much at a certain point. And right. I was like, I knew where it was, so I was like pausing it, and I go, Oh, that's where it should be. And it's kind of obvious when you know it because of two things. One, there's an awning covering it that just says eat. And there's not going to be mm-hmm. a restaurant that just says eat. Right. And if you really look above it on the second floor in the window, there's some sort of a superhero poster. So like I was yeah. positive. I was like, oh, that, that was St. Mark's at that point in time. That's awesome. It is a it is a fantastic shot. And it looks so with, cool. With Hen and Waters, with his like New York trilogy, especially basket case there's so many just gorilla shots of him on the streets of new york where you can tell like they don't have permits they're just no way no way i'm sure that like he didn't even have like probably like a real dolly like that thing's like on a stolen shopping cart you know what i mean right like it is just but it immediately adds this like you said this on authenticity and and grit and grime to the and and it adds to the seriousness of the situation it, it, it's um, such a unique environment, and 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 if you went down there now, it it wouldn't really look the same, and everything would be a lot cleaner with both the film stock and like the physical location and stuff like that. There's 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 a dirtiness and a darkness to it that you just don't really see anymore. Yeah, and it and it's cool. Yeah, it's awesome. Do you by chance know? This is such nerdy talk, but do you know? St. Mark's, that location, how long did it operate there for? It operated, I think, into the early 2000s because I definitely okay. remember – I may have – I'm not 100% sure off the top of my head, but I may have gone there in like one of my first Comic Tropes episodes like seven years oh, ago. Wow. 
I may yeah. have. Because nice. I was, I, I, I think it was pretty recent. You know what? Tell you what. While, while you describe the next scene, I'm just going to see how long it was there. St. Mark's Comics is a modestly sized store right in the East Village of Manhattan. But if you're looking for something, they probably have it. It's amazing how many things they pack into this place. It's a beloved institution here. It's been around forever. And it's a really cool shop with an actual sort of atmosphere. Yeah. So after Brian's freak out, he goes into an alley. He's, there's a, there's a, a wino in the alley drinking and Brian is jonesing. He needs another hit. He gets another hit from Elmer. He gets juiced up. And then he just so happens to be standing outside of a nightclub that has a red neon sign that just says L. Hell club people. And uh, so he goes into the club and this is again, man, this is like another Hen and Lauder staple thing of like this nightclub. I'm assuming he knew the owners of the club and these are real yeah. New York club people in the club, real punkers, real dancers. These are not like movie people. These are just people that I'm assuming he got off the street and they probably shot this like at at night, you know? Oh, I, um, I think you're totally right. But it is and, cool to see like, um, yeah, like a 1980s nightclub, like yes. actually operating. It's cool. And Brian, you know, I mean, he looks like a yuppie because he's in a suit and tie, but yeah. this girl, the, the, this, you know, kind of trashy looking club girl sees him and notices like this yuppie dude is like on drugs. I'm going to go like play with him. I'm going to go hang out with him. Yeah. They dance a little bit together. Um, she know she's like, you're fucked up. And he's just laughing. He's like, yeah. Um, they go outside in the alley and then Chris, we have, I'll just cut to the chase. We have the most bizarre and demented and disturbing oral sex scene of any movie ever. I mean, it basically and, goes from sort of any sort of metaphor to like, so literal, like Aylmer yeah. just sort of being down there. And her kissing on Brian and, and trying to make out with him, he's kind of out of control and her being like, he's out like, of it, man. I mean, he's like, almost passed out. Yeah. And she's like, don't, don't pass out on me yet. And she's like, wow, looks like you have like a, feels like you have like a monster in your pocket. <laughs> Feels like you got a real monster in there. Hey, hey, don't pass out on me now. Here. And then goes down on her knees to perform the act. Aylmer attacks, and I don't know how many censorship bars Jamie's going to have to put over this, but we could, uh, whatever. But guys watching, when you have friends over to watch this movie with you and you're hanging out and drinking and hooting and hollering and having a good time, holy shit, are they not going to expect this magical cinematic moment? It's it's, crazy. it's hilarious and awesome. It, it's it, it's so, crazy. I wonder what that was exactly like for like, honestly, like it, it, I'm, I'm in the movie, but there's a part of me that like starts wondering like, wow, what was it like for the puppet operator? How did, how did the actress like, you know, like yeah. allow herself to, to get in the headspace of doing a scene like this? It, it's crazy. It's a crazy scene. It, it's wild. So Brian, the next day does not know what happened. He doesn't have memories of these kills. Yeah. So. But he's he just, tells, that something happened is all. He just yeah. knows he's blacked out, I guess. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. He knows something is amiss. He lets his brother, his roommate, Mike, know that he needs to take control and, and get out of the apartment. Checks himself into a super shady motel. Yeah. And is, and is, and has a conversation with Elmer and is basically like, I'm going to, I'm going to be in control. I'm going to kick the habit. I don't need you. And then we have this super like dramatic and gritty drug withdrawal scene where Elmer is just taunting and teasing Brian. That's where Elmer is like almost 
in a way, like, yes, he kills people before, but it's in a way that's like where he's the most cruel because he's being like charming and he's singing. He sings like an original song. Yes. Because he, and he says like, Brian, you're not going to be able to like deal with the withdrawal from like my yeah. juice. Like, you know, like maybe some drugs, but not mine. And he's right. And and it's so yeah. mean how he taunts Brian. I didn't quite understand why Brian was okay just sort of like leaving Aylmer just there in the room with him instead of like, you know, I don't know, throwing him out the window or crushing him or something. But I guess he just doesn't hate Aylmer. Yes. And there's a little line where Aylmer says, oh, you want to try and kick me, Brian? Uh, Good luck. Don't worry. I'm not going to bite you. I'm not going to infect you while you're sleeping. Like, Mm. I'll play this game with you. Oh, yeah. So I feel like Brian is like, okay, I still want this creature Mm. in my life but I want to be able to experience low doses of the euphoria, but still be in control. And honestly, man, this is like total drug addict uh, behavior Mm -hmm. where you have an addict who's like, I'll kick tomorrow. And I can control it. It's like the famous line from Jane's addiction. Jane says, you know, like I'm going to kick tomorrow. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that's a good point. Worry about it. Worry (laughs) about it later. So, but Boy, Brian is wrong, and 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 he doesn't last very long. All things he, considered, he can't kick. And Brian and uh, Elmer's like, okay, let's get back to our symbiotic relationship. But before I give you the hit, you got to take me to get more brains. So we have a shady hotel shower scene where, oh yeah, that was very we, we think strange. And the, and the buff muscle guy in the super shower, buff, like that guy was like just. <laughs> He's, he's I don't a, want to say roided up. I mean, maybe it's all natural, but he's a humongous guy. He looks like he yes. belongs in 1980s WWF. Definitely. Big dude. Um, he played a awesome pimp drug dealer in uh, Frankenhooker. Oh, so okay. He, he's a Hen and Lauder regular. That's awesome. Um, so it's odd. You think that Aylmer is going to attack and murder this buff guy? He doesn't. But instead, in a different part of the big public bathroom. In the locker room sort of area. Yeah, the bathrooms. Chris's favorite scene in the movie, you guys. We cut to a gentleman on the toilet. On the toilet. <laughs> it's reading my thing. Another, another deep cut, comic nerds. Yeah, uh, he's reading a comic reading book. Reading a classic black and white underground uh, Dead World yes. comic book. Yes. And he's the one who gets attacked by Elmer and brutally murdered in the uh, bathroom stall. While Brian sort of hesitates to maybe do something, but then is like, no, Elmer has to feast so that I can get my hit. Yeah, it starts so, getting dark. It, it starts at this point. Like by this point, you're like, you want Brian to kick things. But by the time he sort of decides that he can't, go through the withdrawal, it, it's kind of hard to be on Brian's side anymore after that. That's that's the only weird part right. about this is that like, because there's still a little, there's, there's more than a little bit of the movie left, but I wasn't really rooting for the protagonist anymore. I was just rooting for Aylmer to get defeated somehow, but I wasn't yeah. really rooting for Brian because I didn't think that he could beat it now. Yeah. So that being said, I mean, after this scene, we see that, you know, Brian's girlfriend has just hooked up with his brother. Yeah. And, and I sort Brian, of believed in their romance. And at the same time, I was like, you should have like waited. <laughs> like, yeah. But what it's weird because Brian is strung out in his bedroom and they don't know that he's home and yeah. they're getting it on in the couch. And he hears it in the other room and he hears it and he comes out after the deed is done and lets them, he's in full like junky high mode now and is like, you guys got to get out of here because one, when I get back from going out, he's going out to get Elmer and uh, another victim. It's like one of you is going to be in trouble and I don't want you to die. So maybe you're right. You know what? I'm going to revise my, my thinking a little bit just on the fly. I'm going to say, you, you know what? You're right. Like he he's given up fighting Elmer, but he does still try to sort of um, prevent his – now ex-girlfriend basically and his brother from getting killed. So so he is still sort of trying to do the right thing. It's a last ditch effort. Um, yeah. And then 
And then Brian leaves. Weird. The girlfriend, Barbara, actually cares about him enough to follow him. She follows him into the subway. We have a great That's New so York cool. late night subway scene. Um, a cameo? We'll add, we'll add this to Jim's list of big, deep cuts, though. Uh, cameo from uh, Dwayne from Basket Case. Dwayne and Belial, on, technically. Yeah. Dwayne steps onto the train with the basket, the creature inside. And him and Brian have this moment of looking at each other. I think that he recognizes, like, game recognize game. I think he realizes that this is another guy with something dangerous and decides to peace out. Yeah. With no dialogue. Yes. It's he- awesome, man. And it also shows that, um, oh, there's a Hen and Lauder shared cinematic universe here. I have to say, though, if you don't know Basket Case, that that moment would probably be a little confusing because, like, there's no dialogue. It's just this mm-hmm. unspoken, like, they're looking at each other and the weird looking guy with the basket decides to leave. And you're like, OK, I guess that sort of makes sense, even if you don't know who it is. But if you do, it's a it's a pretty fun cameo. It's yeah. a pretty fun cameo. It so th- this was uh, this is kind of, it's it's kind of a heavy or disturbing scene because Barbara actually tells Brian that she does care about him and he needs help and she wants to help him. And then they start to kiss and then she gets killed. And can I just like quickly interrupt and say, they also use some weird animation effects here where every time she looks away from him, Aylmer sort of like jumps out and like wiggles and like, like he's about to eat her. And Brian is just sort of like staring dead eyed. He sort of knows what Aylmer's doing and that Aylmer's about to attack. And he just sort of like, I guess he gives up fighting at this point. Yes. But the, the, even though it's a totally different effect, it's not the puppet. I found those brief glimpses actually quite disturbing. And I, and it's, I was like, yeah, I, I, it's I, bizarre. I, yeah, it's very strange. And it, and it, it comes out of Brian's mouth. That's Aylmer, right. Aylmer is inside Brian. That's right. That's right. Yeah. The, which which makes them even more connected than they sort of were before. You know, like yeah. Aylmer's in him now. He he is yeah. him. It's very strange and um so cool though. The, Barbara bites the dust on the subway. Well, because she tries to kiss him, right? And and, yeah. and Aylmer's in there. Aylmer's inside. Goes goes you know in through her skull into the brain. Brian leaves her on the uh, train and then goes back to the apartment complex where we find him in the alleyway and the old man and lady uh, and lady from the beginning of the movie, the original owners of, of Aylmer totally strung out, but they, they do the exposition dump. Yeah. And they pull a gun on Brian and they're like, we want it's time it for us to get Elmer Elmer back. You yeah. Know? Um, that does not, quite happen um they shoot at a maintenance man that and then, yeah somebody like interrupts everything and w- which causes it to go to chaos yes and then the uh Aylmer attacks the old woman she gets it she she dies gone uh the old man and brian get into a scuffle he gets attacked the old man gets attacked we think that he dies because he hits the floor uh, Brian is going through withdrawal. Aylmer's like, pick me head. up, put, put me on your neck. I think I'm going to be sick. Okay. Hold it. Put me on your neck. Hurry up. As the juice is going in, the old man jumps up, Squeeze. grabs Aylmer, and squeezes the shit out of him. To death. Killing him, but Aylmer releases all of the juice into Brian. This is all very sexual, by the way. Like oh, the yeah. juice and the. Like the well, you know, I, I, I read that Hen and Water like said that. Dildo, that was, it, it's very. <laughs> it, it, I read that Hen and Water didn't necessarily 
intend that to be so sexual, but like once it was, he was like, well, it just is what it is. Yes. It wasn't like that. That wasn't the initial goal. And yet, but it comes across sexual and he's like, fine, it comes across sexual. Like, but, but it, it I'm going to keep it like it, 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 it is what it is. Yeah. So he was sort of aware once they started like filming it, like how sexual, like it, that wasn't necessarily the original metaphor per se, but he went with it. And, and it, yeah. yeah, so it's got like dual metaphors but with sexuality and drugs, which reminds yeah. me of another um, 80s cheapy uh, sci-fi horror movie I'll mention in a minute. Okay. So to wrap things up, um, Elmer hits the ground and is spurting juice and withers up and shakes. And we assume that he's dead. My impression is that Elmer dies. Yeah, I think so. Um, Brian has just got the full hit of, of, uh, the juice. Way too old man, old man falls over. He dies. Yeah. Um, Brian goes back up to his apartment. His brother's Stumbles there. back up, like barely gets in. He has a throbbing growth growing out of the front of his head. He has the gun of that the old man had. Yeah. Shoots himself in the head. We don't the see cops, that though, actually. We don't. This that, is off screen. He brings like the gun and then like we're also cutting outside with, with the brother Mike and the police showing up and stuff yeah. like that. And there's there's a weird set of a light effect starting to, no, no, the, the light effects start after the gunshot, don't they? Yes. And we realize what that is, which is... He's tried to kill himself. Yeah. And Brian's brother, Mike, and the cops burst into his room. Brian has a huge just hole in his head with light emanating out. But he isn't like dead. He's, he's His eyes are open. He's he's staring off like, you know, thousand yard stare. But yeah, that was a, that was a kind of cool, weird ending. Yeah. And then that's that's it. We cut to credits, and that's the story of uh, brain damage. But it's effective. What a, what a, what a trip, man! What a movie! What a great, great phrasing. It is a trip. What an experience, you know? Did you ever see? It made me think of this movie. Did, it, it, it's way lower budget, but have you ever seen the 1982 movie Liquid Sky? Oh yes, it's a set long in New York. Time ago. Yeah. And like basically some aliens do something to like this model. And whenever she has sex with people after they're done, they just sort of like turn into like nothing. They turn into like yeah. tinfoil and like crinkle up and they disappear. It reminded me a little of that, like sometimes, like because it's also filmed in New York in the 80s. Yep. And it was sci-fi and, it, and like, you know, yeah, it, it felt like a drug metaphor on that one. Too. That's a that's a time capsule movie, man. You know, what's funny is like the li- liquid sky. I vividly remember the VHS, the cover artwork really? as a kid going into um, the local uh, mom and pop video store. Hmm. I remember that uh, movie VHS cover specifically. There's certain, I, I'm sure you feel the same way. There's certain VHS yeah. covers that are burnt into my mind. From I when know, I, was a I kid. miss it so much sometimes. Uh, I don't know if I'd have fun going to a video store like to rent anymore, but as a kid, I loved the artwork that used to be on yes. the VHS covers because now it's all just sort of either, you know, photoshopped photos or, or maybe something artsy and minimalist. But we don't get like the painted things, especially horror movies. Right. We, right. We just don't. Like yeah. that was so cool. That that art. It, it made a huge impression on me when I was a kid of just. Yeah. Oh, there's so many bizarre, strange movies. And I didn't watch horror as a kid. I was I didn't either. My parents scared. did not allow it. So it wasn't until high school that, uh, that I got into like, you know, the Friday the 13th movies yep. and, and that was kind of the gateway. But for me, um, th- there's just certain visuals that are associated with all this that, that are, are uh, forever make an impression. Yeah. I wonder what the cover for this one looks like. I haven't seen it, but is it probably just like, the head glowing oh, or something. Um, Brain damage has a couple different 
images for posters online, definitely Google them because okay. there's a couple really good ones. Yeah. Uh, well, Jamie will. will have to pick out his favorite, the, the right one. Yeah. The, we'll leave it on you, dude. And on that note, uh, thank you to uh, Jazzy Jamie Wood for editing this episode. Thank you, editor and, Jamie. Uh, You're doing a lot you, of the heavy Jerry. lifting. Oh, man. He's the hero of the show. Um, Chris, before we go, can I plug something super quick? I Is that okay? would encourage it, Jim. Guys, brand new spanking art book straight off the presses, The Ballpoint Slayer. Let me get a good... Uh, uh, art magazine, ballpoint pen drawings scored off jimbafood.com. Nice. And we also have, uh, where is that merch at? Yeah. Uh, I'll put a link for that in the description. If you're interested in getting some, uh, merch, we'll have some t-shirts, buttons, mugs, things like that. Um, I got to fix my lighting in here cause it's just gleaming everywhere, but we'll get better <laughs> as we go along and figure this out. But yeah. Yeah tpublic.com you guys if you go and just search trash movie bonanza you will find shirts and gear and stuff i love it um, Chris, what can you tell us uh for me uh there's this channel uh if you want to hit subscribe maybe you could also remember to hit the uh bell because um and and if you want to do that on my second channel comic tropes i'd appreciate that as well comic tropes is where i do more edited analysis and history videos of comics uh youtube i'll just explain real quick the algorithm if you aren't putting out something um daily or weekly uh in other words people aren't seeing it on a regular basis even if you're subscribed youtube may not recommend it to you because you may not have been watching that on a regular ongoing basis so hitting that bell makes a big difference i'll mention that um what about social media jim like for me it's just you know look up comic tropes on every channel and you can find it where can they find you yeah i'm the same just under my name jim mafood and you'll get my insta twitter it's just everything there so, we go very simple uh, you guys, thanks as always for joining us. Uh, Chris, this is a, a blast, man. I'm looking forward to the next one. Me too. Um, I'm still brainstorming, but I, I will say I came across a documentary that gave me some ideas. Have you seen on Shudder the documentary In Search of Darkness 2? Yes. It's like five hours all yes. about the schlock and uh, foreign movies of the 1980s. And I will say, we'll probably at some point start exploring maybe 70s and 90s and stuff. But boy, the 80s is our wheelhouse, isn't it, Jim? Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. So <laughs> if you don't know the 80s, you will uh, as you watch our show. We really yeah. appreciate you watching. And uh, we don't have a catchphrase. So until next time, uh, schlock it up. <laughs> yes, there you go. <laughs> Trash Movie Bonanza. Like and subscribe.